Good evening, everybody, and thank you to Boon Hui Tan and um, for his team for all their efforts in making tonight's event possible. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Asia Society for hosting this event and all of our partners across New York, ranging from, let's get my name up there, there you go, uh, ranging from major museums, uh, arts foundations, community activist groups, public schools, independent spaces, uh, who have come together to support this initiative and the ideals we aspire to today. I would also like to thank our small but dedicated team who have worked tirelessly over recent weeks and months to bring all of the separate strands of this ambitious program together. Uh, I think they're here today, so I want to thank in person Anthony, uh, Genoa, Razan, who will be taking part in the uh, panel later, uh, Mohammed, Faisal, and Lucas, who built the website, which I'm going to encourage you all to visit after tonight's event. Um, since this event is also being live webcast, I'd like to acknowledge um, my longtime colleague in, in Jeddah, Mohammed Ali, real name, uh, and strong man, and our wonderful team in London, including Cuba, our designer, Imogen, Valeria, and Arga. Many of you know these characters, and they work tirelessly for the common good. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Kate Seeley from the Middle East Institute, long-term colleague and collaborator, Mohammed Shaka. Uh, a dear friend and the first person that actually introduced us to the concept of collaborating with the United Nations, uh, Jasmine. And I'd like to thank uh, my girlfriend, Helena, and her dad, who fitted me with a new suit last night. Um, and also to our communications team, Ben, Dixon, Kim, and Liza, thank you so much for the initial connection with the Asia Society in the first place and all your work um, over, the, over the last months. Um, this has not been an easy week to launch the Arab Arts and Education Initiative. Uh, it has been a time for all of us working in arts and culture in the Arab world to reflect on, question, and evaluate the impact of the work we are doing and the context in which we are working. As many of you might have read in the New York Times, we have been under some pressure to postpone or cancel this program in light of the terrible news about Jamal Khashoggi and our organization's long-term connections with Saudi Arabia. Uh, it has been especially hard, and many of you don't know this, since many of us in the team uh, organizing this event knew Jamal uh, or his children personally. His children are part of a community of artists and designers with which we regularly collaborate. These events prompted memories from my first visit to Saudi Arabia during an artist's journey across the Middle East in 2003, which you can see here. I had crossed the border from Yemen, uh, there's a pointer here, down here, into Saudi Arabia on a public bus and was dropped off under the light uh, of a neon palm tree. Um, and Jamal was the first person I met in Saudi Arabia. Um, I was dropped off in the center of Abha and taken by taxi to the headquarters of Al-Watan newspaper. At that time, Al-Watan was one of the most progressive newspapers in Saudi Arabia, edited by Jamal. I remember he showed me around the offices and printing presses and then drove me to the Al-Miftaha Arts Village where I was introduced to Ashraf Fayyad, Abdul Nasser Ghadim, and Ahmed Mata, artists with whom I would later establish Edge of Arabia. My encounter with that extraordinary community of artists, poets, and journalists in 2003 was set against the first days of the last Gulf War, and many of our conversations revolved around the role of the artist when faced with such fear and conflict. The aspirations born from those early encounters to mobilize artists towards a greater contribution to world affairs to harness artist's point of view storytelling as an alternative to the mainstream media narrative and to encourage open border crossing dialogue has inspired the work we have been doing since, including the launch of Edge of Arabia as an independent exhibitions platform in 2008. Today, and I don't know what this means, but today is in fact the 10 year anniversary to the day of the first Edge of Arabia exhibition uh, at the University of London and this picture was taken on the 16th of October, 2008. Our more recent project, Culture Runners, this is the Culture Runners RV, 
in downtown Manhattan, invited Middle East artists to travel across and explore the United States away from the urban centers uh, in a converted RV. And this RV has traveled 30,000 uh, kilometers now across the United States. This was at Standing Rock. The one before was a Palestinian artist called Yazan Khalili at uh, uh, just outside of a town called Palestine, and he was searching for all the towns called Palestine in the United States. Many of you have been on that RV, and it's parked in New Jersey now, having a good rest. Um, these are the journeys which led up to establishing this initiative today, and the reason that during intense phone calls with journalists and partners over the last few days, keeping in mind the values that underpin all of our work, that we collectively decided to move forward with the initiative. With Jamal and his family in our thoughts and prayers, we want to reiterate our commitment to amplifying the voices of artists trying to make the world a better place and getting their voices out into the public domain. And so, on Sunday, we were proud to launch this timely initiative with the opening of the Syria 100 Years of Refugee Stories exhibition at Brooklyn Museum. On Thursday, you can attend an artist discussion where Jinan Maki Bacho, Issam Kourbaj, and Mohamed Hafez, who I believe are here with Aysin, the curator, here there they are in the middle there, the curator of the exhibition from Brooklyn Museum. Uh, yesterday, MoMA hosted a fantastic film program with Kuwaiti artist Munira al Qadiri, and I'd like to thank Jay Levinson especially, who's here today and has followed this project from its infancy to its rather dramatic opening. Um, tomorrow we have the Jewel Artex opening for the Young Arab Artist Exhibition, curated by Razan Sharaf, and the Arab Street Artist Residency featuring Abdullah Kandil and Athir. And I'd like to thank Phoenix, who's hosting us there. I have a little video I'd like to play of uh, Athea in the building, uh, working on his, on his paintings, and invite you all to join us tomorrow from 7 p.m. for the opening party of that space. <laughs> Over the weekend, you can visit resident artist Farah Al-Qasimi at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts or hop down to Chinatown on Friday to explore artist books and rare vinyl from the Arab world at Two Bridges in partnership with Fully Booked. Next week, Palestinian artist and scholar Samia Halabi will be speaking at the Guggenheim. And if you're an Arab world curator and museum scholar, you might be lucky enough to be invited to the Metropolitan Museum of Art scholarly seminar to explore how museums today collect and exhibit modern and contemporary art from the Middle East. On Sunday, don't miss the Poets of Little Syria guided tours at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. with Washington Street Historical Society, who are partnering with Pioneer Works to create an augmented reality app in order to preserve the historic Arab-American immigrant neighborhood um, that many of you know about. Uh, I have a short video here um, of a poetry reading by Inia Engler as part of the tour that happened last Saturday. <laughs> أتاها للغنى غيري أني كما جاءوا مع الأقدام جئت ولكني طلبت بها حياة مع الحرية المثلى فنلت And I, I want to thank the, the video team, Sahir and Asya, who are at the back, who have been making these videos every day as we go along. And you can follow them on social media, but they deserve a clap. Um, through the course of these events of the 10-day launch program, we look forward to welcoming men and women from all backgrounds and religions, whether Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, Catholic or Protestant, Sunni or Shia, atheist or agnostic. All are invited to come together around the universal language of art and for the common purpose of imagining a better world. New York deserves it. We have been invited and are deeply honored to launch this initiative in partnership with UNESCO. 
uh, and as our response to the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for us all. This is our effort to engage artists and cultural organizations in the world's only plan for a better world. Our hope is that by fostering meaningful partnerships, which we'll hear about later, between artists and arts organizations in the US and Arab world and the UN, we can contribute to establishing best practices and to providing models for better engagement, better collaboration, better communication, in order to counteract some of the prevailing polarity that we're seeing on the global political stage. In a moment, I will pass you to my colleague and friend, uh, Marie Rudil, UNESCO representative to the UN, to tell you more. But I'd like to end by making a case for the artist's role in all of this. Artists matter because they change the way we consider the status quo. They can channel their power of imagination into solutions to global issues. They can address gaps in the system. And it is often society's cultural leaders who serve as its conscience and its change makers. This is why it is absolutely vital that artists be part of the conversations towards addressing the global challenges such as hunger, poverty, inequality, peace, and justice. Now over to Marie. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. I'm so pleased to be here tonight at the Asia Society. It's uh, especially as this gathering brings together such a high expertise on the issues pertinent to art society. I am confident that the discussion tonight will highlight a fundamental question. What role can art and artists play in building a more sustainable future? Each of us as a story about the impact of art on our lives. Think about it. Art is an expression of our shared cultural heritage, as well as a transmitter of new ideas. It reflects our own individual values while holding up a mirror to the values of society. Culture and art can play a leading role in bolstering the creative economy locally and regionally as well as in promotion of intercultural dialogue, cohesion, and tolerance. You will remember in 2015, in New York, all the 193 member states of the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda, the agenda we are calling for sustainable development, an ambitious universal agenda to end poverty by 2030 and pursue a sustainable future leaving no one behind. Through its 17 goals, the agenda commits every country to take an array of actions that would not only address the root causes of poverty, but would also increase economic growth and prosperity and meet people's health, education, and social needs while protecting the environment. As the UN agency specialized in the field of culture, UNESCO led the advocacy efforts to achieve the recognition of culture's role for sustainable development. We highlighted culture's community-wide social, economic, and environmental impact. It has not been so easy. Culture is not easy to be considered as a real tool, as a real challenge for the economic and political world. But finally, with after the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, the international community recognized in a resolution adopted by the General Assembly for the first time the role of culture as an enabler of sustainable development. You will find the UNESCO brochure in front of the room, which showcases how culture is integrated in development policies and actions and demonstrates through concrete examples the broad scope of culture's contribution to sustainable development. For those of you who are interested, some copies of the publication are available. Culture and art may contribute to a number of targets of the global goals on quality education, promoting gender equality, elevating poverty, improving societies through technological transformation, and making our cities more sustainable. Driven by this aspiration and fulfilling its mandate role, 
UNESCO supports member states to integrate culture into development policies and programs. Much of our work on culture is done through the six cultural conventions, providing a comprehensive framework to safeguard and promote culture in all its expressions, tangible, intangible, natural, movable, or underwater heritage, as well as cultural expression and creative industries. Nowadays, the cultural and creative industries are among the fastest growing sectors in the world, creating nearly 13, 30 million jobs worldwide, especially for youth, employing more people aged 15, 29 years old than any other sector. The cultural and creative industries can make, make up to 11% of all employment within a country. We have a convention that we have adopted, that has been adopted in 2005, that is called Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expression, which sets principles for the design and implementation of policies and measures that give adequate support to contemporary cultural expression and creative economy. You will find some information on this convention in the room, but this convention is really a tool for promoting the role of art and the artist in the world. Finally, UNESCO Creative Cities Network, a global network of 180 cities from 72 countries, is working every day towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda and for Sustainable Development of the World Cities. And last, two weeks ago, I think, Indonesia was celebrating the UNESCO Creative Cities Network at the UN headquarters, and very soon a worldwide meeting will take place in Bali, uh, promoting and reinforcing the network among these cities in the world. Dear friends, culture not only contributes to the achievement of development goals, but as Stephen was saying rightly, culture also plays a key role in fostering social cohesion and cultural diversity. Oh, it is nice to see and to have seen last week in, the, uh, in this wonderful center all the artists coming from Syria, Iraq, from this Arab work together, uh, working together, and uh, really celebrating the art here in this city of New York, uh, celebrating this art, the art as a tool to make, uh, to create a network, a, a feeling of mutual understanding between themselves and the visitors of the center, between themselves and the New York community. Nothing else could be more proactive than the art to create such an environment of mutual understanding. It rem culture reminds us that despite our differences, it is absolutely crucial for us to engage in dialogue with one another, to move towards a better world together. Promoting artistic creativity in the service of mutual respect, understanding and continuous dialogue is key to achieving all the sustainable development goals. UNESCO remains committed to providing a forum where artists and cultural professionals can continue to express themselves, to stimulate new ideas, to challenge mindsets, and to inspire us all to pursue a better world. I am sure that this tonight evening event is contributing to build this better world. Thank you very much. And of course, now I will invite the panelists to come up come up on the stage and uh, to develop and uh, to reinforce our exchange. And uh, thank you so much again and congratulations for this beautiful initiative. Thank you. It is, uh, it is actually a very special moment for, uh, for us four, I think, actually. Everyone's been on different journeys to get to this panel today. Um, and we're very excited about the conversation, which hasn't happened before in this topic, but also between, uh, between us. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about each person, just introduce uh, them with a short bio and how we met. And then we're going to have a separate presentations, five, six minutes. I've been strict before. Um, and then we were going to have a little conversation between us before opening it to a Q&A. Uh, and then rounding off with um, Robert Skinner from the U UN Partnerships Department with a call to action at the end. Um, Rashad Salim, um, who is uh, in New York uh, for the first time, in the United States 
for the first time. I've been trying to get Rashad here for at least three years, and uh, he arrived yesterday. And um, uh, Rashad was born in 1957 in Sudan to Iraqi artist, diplomat father, and a German mother. Uh, Rashad's international upbringing, coming of age in Iraq and later exile, inform his expeditionary art, seeking insight and beauty from civilization's cradle to its teeters on the grave's edge. Rashad studied at the Institute of Fine Art in Baghdad and St. Martin's in London. In 1977-78, he took part in the Norwegian explorer Tor Heidel's Tigris expedition. Um, if you don't know Tor Heidel, I'm partly Norwegian, so this is like our most famous and important sort of hero. So when I heard that uh, Rashad was actually the, the only Iraqi crew member on that expedition where Tor Heidel often created a United Nations sort of formula of different nationalities, and I think they threw the UN flag on that. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, in 2015, he launched Ark Reimagined, which we will hear about later today, a project questioning what the Ark, Noah's Ark, would have looked like if it was based on the ecology and craft traditions of Mesopotamia and built using materials and techniques during that period. In 2016, uh, he established Safina Projects to deliver that project. Uh, Rashad and I first met when I worked at the British Museum. I sent Rashad into a particularly tough East, uh, East London school mm. where he taught them about 12 different categories of headgear. And that was an exciting project. And the teachers were definitely uh, a little bit uh, interested in what came out of the classroom uh, on those things. So um, that's Rashad. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have Razan al-Saraf, who um, is the curator of the Young Arab Artists exhibition uh, that you can come and see tomorrow from 7 o'clock at Artex. And she's also one of the main artists in that show. Uh, but Razan actually came to us as an intern and has had the fastest career trajectory of anyone I've ever met because she's now the main curator and on the main panel here tonight. Deservedly. And deservedly. And that's a testament actually to uh, when she started in her own humble way to show us the work that she was doing and her sensibilities. Uh, this is the right platform for Razan and representing the younger generation because we're all you know, a little bit older now. Um, Razan uh, Saraf is a Kuwaiti-born artist based in New York. Through painting, she examines the social, religious, and political climate of the Middle East. Uh, Razan is a recipient of the Ministry of Higher Education of Kuwait Merit Scholarship, the SVA Alumni Society Scholarship and Award, as well as multiple Kuwait Culture Academic Merit Awards. You haven't mentioned the Edge of Arabia internship, but I'm going <laughs> to add that there. Um, she ex has exhibited, sorry? I'll add a bottom tag. Yeah, I put it in there. Um, and uh, she's exhibited internationally, and I really can't wait for New York audiences to explore, experience her work. Uh, Matthew Mazota, um, who's we met at MIT in, in, in 2014 at the launch of Culture Runners, uh, where Matthew was, um, was teaching at MIT at the mm. time. And um, since then, we've been on multiple journeys, including to Jeddah, uh, and to Nebraska, and all over the United yeah. States. Um, I know, he'll talk about that connection, actually, which is um, not as absurd as it sounds. Uh, Matthew Mazota works at the intersection of art, activism, and urbanism, focusing on the power of the built environment to shape our relationship, relationships and experiences. He received a BFA from the School uh, of the Art Institute of Chicago, a, a Master's of Science from MIT, uh, and is a Loeb Scholar at Harvard, currently a Loeb Scholar at Harvard. I well, yeah, I'm a Loeb Fellow. A Loeb Fellow. That happened, that's residence. forever, is it? That's forever. That's forever. Fellowship. There you go. Um, so I'm so excited uh, to bring us together under the framework of artists looking at this area of sustainable futures and the sustainable development goals. So um, actually... Rashad will go first, and he, um, I put this next slide in. I just want to immediately, yeah, oh, that's not the right one. That's the right one. I want to immediately, for Rashad's project, Art Reimagined, uh, Rashad actually came from Iraq two weeks ago via Sweden, but this puts us really in the situation where Rashad has been working um, on the project. Can that, can that be synced with it? In Arashat. Yeah, okay. Now this, this, is, uh, this is five years ago, and my first return to Iraq after 
being away since since the the eighties. On the Tigris uh, uh, flotilla expedition that took place from, uh, I'm sorry, but there was supposed to be a little bit uh, So, I mean, that, that, that's a difficulty, and he's speaking over his singing because he's. <laughs> he's singing about you. He is singing about me. It's, it, it's extemporizing. And uh, as we're going down on, on the, this Gufu and the Tigris. So that's uh, five years ago and the beginning of, of a journey that I'm continuing now and that will continue for quite a while. But it's really important that, that you know, it's this reconnection with, with the river itself, with the land itself. And doing that trip, what, what I noticed very clearly was the desertification of that river. Over here you have uh, pictures of, of the... Uh, the marshes, and this is, this is in the mid-70s, at the height of, of uh, the fertility of the marshes. There was no real problems at the time. Right before they started to uh, uh, be destroyed by the building of dams and, and uh, wars, etc. Is Russia's microphone working okay? It's going, you're, you're, could we, because we're meant to be seeing, see, we're meant to be speaking to this screen, sorry to interrupt, but this screen is showing a, um, uh, something a very different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if there's a way to, um, otherwise, uh, Rashad, maybe you're going to have to watch out when you turn around because the mic goes off. Ah, uh, okay. All right, sorry about that. Yeah. 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 Ah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get a crick in the neck. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a long story, so putting it in seven minutes, you have to really sort of, uh, um, yeah, give you a bit of room. So um, this is, this is the, the marshes in 1977, 76. Uh, Tor Heyerdahl visited the marshes searching for uh, the material to build a boat. And he, has, he was quite famous for having uh, made expeditions and proving that there was connections between civilizations and that the oceans and seas were not barriers, but actually means of, of engagement. And this, uh, called diffusionism, was, was quite radical at the time. This is in the 1940s. You know, prior to that, people had thought civilizations grew in, in isolation from one another. And it's this, uh, uh, if you look at this boat, this is a, a boat built out of bundles of reeds, very much like the they, uh, uh, same technique used to build the architecture in the marshes. They're cathedral-like. And Malis, which are like guest houses, Tor over there is, uh, I can't point with this because I have to change it, but uh, Tor is sitting over there and, and uh, speaking with the Marsh Arabs um, to uh, uh, um, get the builders for this, uh, this boat. So you have, you have this, this, these techniques of, of gathering together and making bundles, and uh, um, we have evidence of these kind of boats from... Uh, from ancient times, from uh, Akkadian times, at least, if not Sumerian as well, and he had brought he had brought um, uh, Amara Indians from Lake Titicaca, who still use these kind of boats. These boats have disappeared in in, in Iraq quite a while ago, and they they built these boats with the Marsh Arabs. And what really struck me was the language that they had, that they shared. We had started off with with having sort of a, a series of uh, we're back to that. A series of... Um, we got the wrong image again. Yeah, yeah. a series of uh, translators from Armara to Spanish, from Spanish to, to uh, English to Arabic, and then sort of all the way back. But very quickly, they were speaking and, and communicating together, the Marsh Arabs and, the, and this, uh, these Armara Indians. We built the boat and, and sailed in 1977 uh, to prove that... Uh, these kind of boats could have connected the civilizations, you know, the Mesopotamian, the, the Indus. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the Indus and then uh, the Nile. And with a crew of, of uh, 11 from uh, nine different nationalities, Tor was very much a, a, an internationalist and, and a, a UN kind of person. We actually sailed with the UN flag. Um, and... Uh, you know, gathered us together. But in Djibouti, when we reached the East African coast, we were immediately uh, 
there are sort of we hearing bombings and there's a lot of conflict in that area, and we decided to burn the boat. And this is after five months at sea. Yet at the time, Roman, at the time he had uh, written to the United Nations to uh, uh, protest against the against the militarization of this area, and it was sort of like a prophecy. This the burning of the boat that I. I, um, you know, it, it struck me, it, 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 this, this, this the burning of civilization, the, the destruction that we are seeing. Um, during, after that period, of course, you had uh, the wars with uh, Kuwait and, that's, and uh, you know, all, all the wars, the different wars. But during this period as well, you had the building of dams on the Tigris Euphrates, and very soon you had the desertification of, of the marshes. Now, here is the, the, the trip down the, the Tigris in, in 2013. And this boat is, a, is a, a, called a guffa, and basically a basket that has been covered in, in tar, a very primitive one. And I had originally made it online with somebody that didn't know how to do it, because everybody was saying that there was nobody, uh, nobody could build it. And uh, we just found a basket maker. And, uh, <laughs> Build it. So it sort of it ended up sort of like a 40% guffa, but it took me down from east uh, southeast Turkey all the way to the marshes in stages. This is uh, 19, uh, 2013, so there's still uh, security issues. Um, like I said, you know, the main thing was the fact that there was a sort of a, a, a real desertification. You couldn't see anybody really using the rivers. Uh, there's hardly any life on the rivers. But after that trip, I uh, did my own uh, expeditions and found the last makers of these guffas in Babylon. Yeah. During this time as well, there was uh, uh, Ernest Finkel, Professor Ernest Finkel, uh, translated a cuneiform tablet that described the ark as round. And I've always been interested in the idea of the, of the Ark, and specifically just how unlike or, or how alien to the culture of, of Mesopotamia um, and the environment of Mesopotamia the Western Ark is. There's no, no connection whatsoever between that Ark and, and, uh, and the, the culture of... Can I ask, Rashad, for the, everyone knows the story of Noah's Ark, but is there a, is there a geography and a time that most sort of experts agree that there was, this story is based on some real event. Can you just place us at the origin? We know, we know for sure that there was a, a flood, and not just uh, in this area, but globally. And this is like 24, between 24 and, and uh, 8,000 BC. We can see, for example, with topographic uh, studies of, of the Gulf area, that the, the Tigris, Euphrates rivers actually continued that, uh, the valley to the Straits of Hormoz. So there was definitely flooding. But we also know that there are sort of 350 different uh, flood stories globally. It's not a localized thing. It's, it was a global climatic event. Um, and so there have been flood stories from all over the world, including, for example, from Australia and the Aborigines have an oral uh, history or, or story of, of the floods. But we have this Western model, even though there isn't a Western European flood story. But they've got us through the whole Semitic sort of tradition. So um, the, the round boat that you see over there, the round um, art that was built in Kerala, again, not, not using really the material, it sank immediately, you know, as soon as they... <laughs> yeah. And the, uh, the arc, the Western arc also, I mean, it's absolutely impossible for it to to uh, float. But during the trip down on the river and with the coracle, the guffa, I had a sort of an epiphany and, and the thought that rather than having one big boat that, you know, had specially built boat that hadn't been tried before, it could have been rather a gathering of, of all the different types of boats, the material that made up the village and that would have existed at a time and place. So it would have been a, a gathering rather than 
a, um, you know, something uh, extraordinary. And we did ARC and, and actually launched the idea of, of, of going for it, building it, with uh, Stephen at Edge of Arabia in, in 2015, with the first trips to Iraq in 2016. So I owe debt to uh, Stephen for having uh, believed in this, that this is possible, and for giving me that first initial uh, push. I'd been very, very uh, depressed prior to that with what was happening with ISIS, etc., and so forth. And the idea of, of connecting, going back to Iraq, I think is, is the main uh, 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 sort of gift of, of this expedition or this, this idea. So here you have the, the ark this, that I'm imagining that's made out of different kinds of bows. You've got the, the oops, the gufwa. In the center, you've got the, the, a boat of some sort radiating from it, and you have over here the kelek, which is basically a raft. All these boats are, are types of boats that you find globally, all over the world, these different types of boats. And I think that's also very important, because what I'm working with is also the idea of, having a, of there being a shared vocabulary of making you know, globally, you know, things like ropes, we're not invented by somebody going, Eureka, a rope. It's, it exists everywhere else. A bundle exists everywhere else, and you have boats made with these techniques. So I returned in 2016 and uh, started building these, these uh, gufwas, uh, starting off with fishermen gufwas and uh, getting them larger, because we have evidence of these... Oh, shit. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have evidence of these, uh, uh, these uh, gufwas being, you know, six meters. So if I just run through... Chris, I, what I, Can I ask a question just about, at the heart of this project is that, you know, there is a story that everybody knows, the Noah's Ark story, and we all, we all perceive a one vessel, and it's normally made out of wood or mm. many other things. And what, what do you think drives, because your, your proposal is so rational and it seems very sort of logical, it's actually very beautiful, and it actually relates to when you see flooding now, how people gather things together to survive. Mm -hmm. where, did the, where did that narrative that's now got, you know, in America, when I was traveling in the RV, you know, people really do believe in the actual big boat. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's a guy in Kentucky that's built the theme park with yeah. the actual big boat. So where did, where did that, you know, why did that mythology spread so... Uh, so fast, and why is it so prevalent now in Hollywood? I think uh, w one thing is that the, the, the flood story was first recorded around 3500 BC and things like the Gilgamesh. And between that recording and the event, uh, and between recording and us, it's the same amount of time. So there's a vast amount of time between that. And people generally uh, narrate things in their own image. So, you know as well as this whole thing of, of uh, Chinese whispers. So, yeah, from, from the earliest stories in the, uh, to the Bible, translation, etc., you get uh, all sorts of differences. Yeah. Yeah, things change. Wrap up. Pay I shall wrap up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so these are, these are boats that I've been doing, and, and uh, very importantly, you know, they are iconic for, for Iraq. And now I'm working in, in the south, in Huer. Uh, with communities to build these sort of iconic boats called mashhoofs. You know, very beautiful and recognized by, by themselves as artworks, by the people who make it. Finding the older people, we want to bring these later on out to the rivers of the world, just rushing through. And of course, the, 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 main, the main reward is, is meeting people, you know, getting people together, and, and that's what's, what's happening. You know. So, yeah. so thank you, Rashad. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we move on to uh, to Razan, to really that that you, you know, uh, Rashad is actually he is actually building this ark, and he's actually employing communities in Iraq to build boat one boat at a time, and then the idea of seeing a new a new proposal for the Ark in somewhere like the East River or the Hudson Valley or the Mississippi or the Thames actually is a metaphor for our current climate change approach to climate change, that it is a gathering together of what we have, not some, we were talking about Elon Musk's, not some 
fantasy spaceship that's going to take us up. And actually, the more you think about this Ark mythology, the more you see it in TV shows and in Hollywood right now that something's going to save us while the time is running mm. out. And I think we'll talk about that a bit later. Azan. Thank you. Uh, that's me. <laughs> One more time. OK. Um, I will start talking about uh, the show that I curated that's opening tomorrow and sort of uh, fill that into the context of sustainability um, and go through the artists that are part of the show. I'm going to start with myself. Um, this is a series of portraits called the 100 Portrait Series. Um, it was uh, actually called Daesh, but then I thought that was too uh, charged. Um, but they're basically portraits of ISIS members. Um, and they're painted on oil. They're each uh, sort of head size, 8 by 10. And there is a grid of 100. In the photo, there's just 84, because I couldn't fit it on a wall. But um, So the whole concept of this project started um, when I was thinking about uh, this assignment that I had in art school. Um, and the assignment was to paint 10 monsters. So everyone came back with you know, crazy monsters, googly eyes, sharp teeth. Um, but I thought about something that hit closer to home. So I thought terrorists. Um, no one really paints terrorists or wants to, you know, spend the time looking them up and look at their faces and sort of get them in with oil paint on canvas. So I thought it would be this cool sort of psychological project to start on. Um, and as soon as I got 10, I sort of went crazy and spent a year painting 100. Um, the sort of concept that I that evolved while making this piece was. Um, uh, sort of debating the history of portraiture in the beginning between the East and West. So how in the Middle East or Islamic tradition, uh, you don't really paint uh, people because it's seen as tampering with the hand of God or attempting perfectionism. Um, whereas in the West, it's more like idolization or celebrating a loved one or royalty. Um, so I thought this would be a cool concept to sort of uh, start a cross-cultural dialogue between um, uh, the traditions of Middle Eastern painting and then the West. Um, this also evolved into sort of this project on thinking about terrorism. What makes a terrorist? Um, are we so different from them? Like, what causes a person to sort of switch gears and decide to run off to the desert in Syria and, you know, make bombs and go crazy? Um, so the dialogues that I've had um, with people about that has resulted to um, sort of art being this uh, segue between barriers that are created by um, religious oppression or censorship. And uh, a form of art is like there for you to express different thoughts that you're not used to expressing um, with sensitive topics. So um, yeah, so basically, the images were sourced from um, mugshots, but also selfies and screenshots of propaganda videos and news websites. Um, and this also started a whole uh, research project on how ISIS recruits members. So social media came into the picture because um, sort of ISIS got to rise through Twitter, basically, and uh, recruiting kids from the US, from Europe, from Africa, and the Middle East through um, targeting these kids that don't feel like they have a, a place, a safe space at home. Um, and sort of giving them this place to escape to and uh, be a part of this bigger thing. Um, so yeah, that's my project. Um, the next, uh-oh. Oh, it's crashed. It's gone. <laughs> the show's over. Um, well, I can still talk about it until she shows up, but Farah Salem is a Chicago-based artist, but she's also from Kuwait. And she does, she's a photographer, and she's studying um, art therapy as her master's degree. Um, but she sort of is this artist that wants to tackle issues on feminism and uh, religious oppression and like the social cultural um, dialogue between the role of men and women in traditional society. Um, so she, if you caught a glimpse of the picture, uh, it was her in a abaya. And that's like the traditional uh, gown that uh, Middle Eastern women wear. But she was tr trying to, oh, welcome back. Uh, she was trying to reclaim that image by wearing a white one. Uh, it's from her series called The Dove. And she uh, put on this gown and went through uh, smaller, lesser known areas in Kuwait um, and took these photos. And the photos are sort of her way of showing um, her reclamation of the traditional gown 
um, and she wanted to express her freedom within it. Um, the background of this is actually a calligrapher called El Cid, who's also part of the program. Uh, he's very cool. Um, and yeah, you could see these prints. Um, I was going to ask, um, in the show, you, when you were doing it, we, you talked about the, the sort of the image of someone like you or, or someone like Farah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, there was a feeling that your image had been taken away from you, that your, your, uh, your identity was being so sort of presented in newspapers mm -hmm. or, or this, just because of where you're from or this, that the work was kind of an, an, uh, an attempt to to reclaim that image. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that in the context of being in America? Because I think mm -hmm. the, the things that you're showing, especially the first project, is really quite um, provocative mm -hmm. in New York City. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think being in New York just gives us the platform to express things that we can't express back home. So I wouldn't be able to show those ISIS portraits in Kuwait, but having the space to do that here and to do it not just to speak against it, but to open a dialogue and to have it serve as a starter to a conversation, um, we hope that this translates to the values back home and then that could um, cause like a shift in perception and, and hopefully change the culture behind it. Um, so, do you, do you fit in terms of the recruitment of young people into mm -hmm. extremism? Because, you know, uh, my generation, Ahmed and Abdel Nasser, and a lot of our friends in Saudi, they were, they were targeted and they were recruited and they went to schools that became kind of training camps and then they were asked to go to Afghanistan. You were talking about social media. Is your, are your generation, are you being targeted through social media? Does it, does it connect into your world? Because it's not just this, it is quite creative. There's music videos and like you were saying, yeah. selfies and emoji, that whole world of you know, targeting young people who might be disillusioned do you, does that, is that a reality for people you know? Or? Um, not that I know personally, but from the research I did in the project, it's just, um, just regular kids. Um, people from, I saw Massachusetts and Kentucky and Belgium and um, Africa, just kids who are online and expressing their um, discomfort, I guess, in their current lives. And then that just makes them an easy target for, mm. for ISIS. But um, yeah, I definitely think that social media you know, has its pros and cons, um, but it is a way, or making art about it, I think, is a way to just bypass um, the negative aspects of it. Mm. Two um, minutes. Two minutes? Oh, no. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we have this artist, Samer Fouad, um, who has a funny story about his installation. So we were in the basement of Art X, and there was this random shower in the middle of the spot. Um, so we thought we could um, fill the shower with an installation. Um, and he had this installation called To Seek Refuge, um, it's about the refugee crisis and, um, in Syria, and it has an animated GIF of a uh, faceless woman that rotates. Um, he tries to speak about the loss of identity when you are labeled or seen as uh, a refugee or an immigrant. Um, it's also an interactive installation, so from the outside it would say ref uh, immigrant, but when you go inside um, there's a poster that you can hold um, that says refugee. So he talks about sort of that invisible border of how that label switches and how a person loses their identity in the process. Um, sorry, I have to speed. But this is uh, Kuki Jijo or Tarek Sultan. Uh, he's an artist from Kuwait who does um, these really cool iPad sketches uh, on screenshots or scans of magazines um, and uh, Instagram posts. So he sort of tries to talk about um, uh, pop culture, consumerism, but also iconography and um, sort of using, uh, using you know, the method of cartoonifying into speaking of culture and tradition and um, uh, Islamic aesthetics. Um, but he also has a project on censorship, so how magazines are somewhat censored in the Middle East to cover parts of the woman body that they don't want to show. Um, he sort of uses that as his... Um, uh, mode of expression. Good and yeah, timing. That's the last one. I just we got the wrap up from Kate. Video, so. I think. Thank you, Reza. Yeah. Huh? Sorry. A hats video. Oh, yeah. Do we have? We that? can we, play a little. We can just play a little snippet. bit. Yeah. Sorry, we had one video one. That was my yeah. cue. Video one. Sorry. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, can we hit play? Sweet. No, 
listener. <laughs> Maybe just walk, just 30 seconds on that video. Okay. <laughs> uh, that video was by uh, artist Ahad al -Moudi. She's based in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it just speaks on, well, first of all, the song that re-emerged from underground suddenly and became this viral hit because of social media. Um, and she actually uh, created the traditional uh, gown using uh, photos from Instagram. And uh, the dance is, uh, used to be a dance on like, uh, in the middle of the desert, just men, but now it's like a wedding dance. So she made this whole video about celebrating, um, yeah, that song. So we were, Very sarcastic. In, in, in Razan's show, there's this like young energy and there's this social media focus and this expertise at playing with these technologies that actually my generation sort of had to keep changing phones and everything was uncomfortable and stressful and wires and new plugs and new adapters and we were all stressing to get audiences. But actually in the Arab world, they have the highest use of social media in the world per person, the, the highest per capita consumption and production of social media. So in terms of getting a message out or sharing information, it's that generation that we're interested to to engage in the sustainable development goals and think how that can be used for a force for good rather than just cat videos and this kind of stuff, of which is happening a lot. Um, sorry, Matt, we're running a little bit behind. Matthew, uh, I, I believe you have a, a video. Yep. And would you like to introduce Yeah, him? I was going to say, actually, I, there's some cats in my video as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name's Matthew. I'm an artist. Um, it's actually really nice to be here under this umbrella of the 17 goals that the UN has. So um, as an artist, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is actually, you know, basically what you're going to see is a reiteration of um, artists playing a role in how some of these larger initiatives can be put forward and how those gaps could be filled or how new thoughts could be put together. Um, I put together this video. It's um, in three different sections. Um, the first two sections, I'm going to be taking one of the goals. Um, and illustrating with two works, and then the last one we'll just say is kind of Middle East meets Middle West, if that makes any sense. That's quick. So, video. Video two. This being. Yeah. Here at uh, Pacific Street Park in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, we're going to use the Park Spark project transforming dog waste into energy to power public art. First thing we'll do is we'll wait until the dog does its business, and then uh, we'll scoop it up in one of these biodegradable bags that's offered by the Park Spark Project. Pop it in there. Stir is a little wheel here, and you can spin this thing, and it goes right to the tank. And this mixes up the water and the dog waste inside. Methane is about 30 to 70 times more potent than carbon dioxide, so by burning it, you're actually reducing it. Um, there's carbon dioxide and water, which is a great thing for the park. Get involved and build a project that uses the energy from the methane. And this has the digester with a little uh, tube coming off of it, powering a kettle for some tea. So it's this free source of energy that can be used in any way the community wants to use it. I was invited to Boulder, Colorado to do a project where they have the highest density of climate scientists. So they have these federal labs. So all this research is there, but it's a foodie town. So I asked these 40 uh, scientists there, um, what are plants and natural resources leaving this area in the next 20 to 40 years? Ah, I see. <laughs> um, and so we actually asked all these chefs to um, cook that food, and we presented it as this table. The project's called Harm to Table, playing off Farm to Table. So we're, in essence, we're translating data into an experience. This is a menu of what you'd be eating. So these are plants that would be leaving this area. And we had music. This is a darker work for me. It's kind of like the burning of Rome. You're eating the last of this landscape. So everything was gravity fed. You have two uh, soup and two kombuchas and chocolate. They go down these um, copper pipes and everybody can serve themselves.
trying to connect people to their direct um, environment. This was another goal that I thought played into uh, a lot of the works I do. In January 2011, artist Matthew Mazzara was invited by the Coleman Center for the Arts to organize an artwork with the people of York, Alabama. During his initial visit to York, the artist asked people from the community to bring something from their living rooms so that they could recreate a living room outdoors in the middle of the street as a way to provoke discussion about what were on people's minds and to generate ideas about what direction they might go in. From the discussions in this outdoor living room, they identified that York really had a lack of public spaces that are truly open to everyone. And as they listened to each other's stories and experiences of York, this became a common thread. They also identified that the many abandoned houses all over the downtown have been bringing down the look and feel of York for years. From this conversation, they developed a project that uses the materials of an abandoned house as well as the land it sits on to build a smaller house on the footprint of the old house. Open House is a unique event space. It is a collaboration with the people of York, Alabama to transform a blighted property in York's downtown into a new public art project that has the shape of a house but can physically transform into a 100-seat open-air theater free for the public to enjoy shows, play, movies, and any other event people can think of that supports community life in York. And when the theater is folded back up into the shape of a house, the property is a public park for anyone to enjoy. Open Health directly addresses the lack of public space in York, Alabama. By using the concept of transformation to turn an abandoned building into a new community space, it provides opportunities for people to come together for years to come. Stages scenes such as the old telephone switchboard operator, conversations in the coffee shop, 
and the elaborate montage of Saturday nights on Main Street in the 1960s. On a warm night in November, the Main Street of Lyons, which is usually empty after dark, fills with people from the community and beyond for the opening of the storefront theater and the debut of the movie Decades. As parents, grandparents, and children of all ages gather on Main Street to witness something experimental in their own downtown, they sit side by side to see themselves, their neighbors, and the town they call home reflected so clearly back to them. The storefront theater taps directly into the opportunity that exists in rural towns across America to creatively repurpose and reprogram downtown buildings that once were the backbone of community life into new sites of experience, interaction, and dialogue. The message on this night is simple. People that sit together can dream together. The project has been going for about three years, and this is just last month we had the, the government help support a project. So this is an experience that would probably never happen otherwise besides art actually penetrating into this social fabric. The last little bit I'll just share is, you know, I do these outdoor living rooms, as you saw. I'm always an outsider, so how, how do I know anything about anything when I walk in? I always start with this open notebook, and we start to do these. This is trying to capture voices of people that don't go to meetings, are not representing themselves, maybe don't have time or, or have that uh, sensibility. So try to go into their public spaces. This is here in the Bronx a couple of months ago. And this was in Jeddah we did uh, two years ago. I work with these students because I didn't speak Arabic. And we can speak about that later if we like. Yeah, you, I got wrap up ages ago for you. Um, <laughs> thank you for being generous. That's okay, no problem. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, you know, it, it, it's not as easy as it seems to link artists together with the sustainable development goals because there's artists kind of making work about a theme. But here you've seen different artists actually being the theme or, or actually creating a solution. Um, and I think that one of the things that ties all three of you together is this experience between um, sort of East and West, if you like, or Arab world and USA, if we want to frame it like that. Just starting with Matthew and then going through, can you talk a little bit about that that, that journey you went to Saudi Arabia and when perhaps that big narrative of sort of that they're very different places, that they're somehow in opposition, and yet you took a common theme uh, to that narrative. Okay, I try. Was that a question? That's a question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, everybody looks at all the differences. Are there similarities? You know, I, I'm sure we all have them. And then, um, you know, the media is responsible for giving us a lot of this narrative between the Middle East and the United States, or let's say North America. And I think that, yeah, artists can play such a role in trying to tell these alternative narratives, because how do you get the texture? How do you know what a place is like? And I think that artists have a, have a real role to be able to basically challenge that narrative or shape it in a way that gives empathy and an entrance into it. Um, for me, I'm always the outsider, so, Here's another town. Lyons, Nebraska means nothing to me. Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, Singapore. These are all places. What are the issues? Where is the, the city or the local government not taking care of an issue or the community? Can we find that and can we make an artwork that allows people to um, enter that, into that issue and explore it more together? Um, one thing I realize is in the United States is um, there's a phenomenon of you know, rural America, as you saw, the main streets are all kind of dying and dead. And this is through globalization, Amazon one click, you know, economies of scale. The mom and pop store cannot handle that kind of business model anymore. So all these downtowns that were built for commerce 
um, are all gone. The same thing happened when I got to Jeddah. You have Al Balad, the old city. It was designed for a certain type of commerce. Cars cannot get in there. Air conditioners allow people to sprawl. Um, it's abandoned in certain ways. Obviously, it has commerce, but it's, it's a different thing. Um, anyways, I leave it at that. What about you, Rashid? Because you're working in um, such a complicated story and reality between Iraq and the United States, and you're working on this... Um, this story that actually everybody is, is, is universal, and this theme that is arguably the most uh, uh, urgent of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the climate change crisis. So how, how are you navigating that, that thing between you know, being from Iraq and wanting to tell this international story, especially, you know, you've just arrived in the US, so I'm not gonna ask you what you think about it, but... Um, that wasn't a question either, yeah. but, um, but I'm going to leave well, well, it at that. Please comment. First thing, really, is, is, is I, I've dropped. I was an activist for quite a while, directly uh, looking at the issues and, and uh, protesting them, but I've dropped that politics. I mean, the situation now in Iraq is just so uh, completely uh, disastrous that there isn't even any room now for politics in a way, as an artist speaking. It has to be directly engaged with it. Uh, secondly, it's questioning really what is art and what is my role as an artist? What is an artist? Because art is, is, uh, is a Western concept, it's an Eastern concept, but they're two different types of art. I mean, uh, the Western concept of art being an object or made or, or that is abstract or, or alien from or, or differentiated from lived reality is not one shared in the East. You know, traditionally, art in, in, in a lot of cultures around the world, not just in the East, is a lived, is a lived uh, uh, reality. It's an engagement with the, with the material, with the crafts, with the way you, what you dress, what's around you. That's collapsed. And this is what's critical. So in Iraq, what you have is, is a collapse of the crafts that connected between the environment and society. So we've got a lot of artists, great artists, all over the world, but we don't have a craft movement. Do you see your kind of positioning as a new type of artist? I think it's, an, it's a new type of art that is an, possibly the oldest type of art. Right. You know? And a reiteration of, of this essential role of the artist as being that medium between the environment and the needs mm -hmm. and the expression of, of a culture. So it's, 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 it's not a matter of only returning these, these uh, crafts of boats, etc., but looking, looking to them as means of of uh, solutions, mm -hmm. you know, of, of work you know, from, from the local environment. I think that's it. I feel a great deal of responsibility you know, uh, and in, in what, what I'm seeing in Iraq and the need to re-engage. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just going to bring in Razan, because you framed that Eastern Western thing as something where you said that you're going to talk about things here that you couldn't talk about there with, as a way to influence your reality there. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of the artists that move to the States or to Europe to study art are sort of looking for an outlet to express things that they're frustrated with or that they're not um, excited about or something that they don't want to be censored for speaking out about, against. Or um, So I see art as sort of this digestible form of information that they um, are more free to express here, that they can transform um, the like core values and like traditions of back home. So it's not just about making art here and being quiet, it's about making art here and hoping it translates mm -hmm. and then hoping that affects the change. And what do you think, you know, the two artists either side of you, they, they don't really sell their work they're not part of uh, any kind of trajectory into a famous gallery mm -hmm. or, or, I mean, Rashad's working on a museum show, but what, you know, you're about to have your first show in a hot spot of New York. Uh, the probably maybe someone will come and buy your work and you'll go into that world of, of the traditional kind of art, what a Western artist mm -hmm. does. And you're just looking at Matthew and Rashad's work, which is not about the object, mm -hmm. it's about the impact, and it's not even often about them. It's about the people that, you know, who take part in the project, like Bill, or like the, the people who are making the boats, which isn't you, it's, it's 
you're kind of overseeing the project. How do you feel about this as a, as a model for an artist? Is it something new to you, or do you think that um, uh, it's in opposition to the kind of prevailing idea of the mm -hmm. artist that young people aspire to? I don't think there's uh, anything negative with either side. I think there's values that you can get from being like the idea maker and having that work itself out into something that's bigger than yourself. And then there's the value in you being the forefront of sort of what you want to express and like how you want to, oh no. no, no. Uh, <laughs> Case has got a sign saying end. end, like the, the, <laughs> the end. In red. It, yeah. Um, 12 o'clock, Cinderella. Um, I think we, we're, we were going to have some Q&As. Could, we could ask Kelly. Could we have Kelly? Could we have... Uh, where's Kelly? Could we have some, a, f a little bit of time for some Q&As? I would just do maybe one more question on the panel. Okay. I can't see Kelly. No permission for that. I'm, I am going to actually break with Kate's rule. I'm going to ask, is there any question from the audience? Because I think we should... Just, just one question, maybe. Sorry, we've gone on too long. Would, any, would anyone like to ask a question to any of the panelists? There, very good. Yes, please, yeah. There should be a microphone, but... Here comes somebody. Okay. Uh, my, my first name is Siba, and my last name is Das. Siba Das. I'm a retired UN official, and I now write about art. Okay. Uh, so I was struck by, I think, one, le one, over, one uh, thematic conclusion that I might draw from the presentations um, this evening is that um, there's an acute need, a strong need, a powerful need to reestablish or to create you know, an interactive uh, connection between so-called fine art on the one side and artisanal art on the other side, so to speak. Okay? Because as you said, Rajan, that the artisanal, uh, the artisanal arts are dying. There's obviously a need to stop that, to reverse that process. And perhaps, you see, so-called fine artists, you know, could facilitate that, yeah. could work very actively with the artisans of the world mm -hmm. in order to, to, to reverse the trend towards the dissolution of uh, the artisanal arts, you know, which is happening in many, many countries, you know, all around the world, not only in developing countries, but also in the developed countries. You know, the, the old artisanal industries are dying, and there is a need to revive them, to recreate them, to reinvent them, so that they meet contemporary needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously, what you need is scaling. And one way of scaling would be to 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 pursue this interaction between art and artisanship. That's my point. I think not so much a question, but a, a lovely comment to end on. I think we we all agree. We're gonna we're gonna run out of time. I will say one thing because I'm about to introduce um, Robert. Skinner from the UN Partnerships Department. Robert, before you get up, I want to say that um, actually uh, we, it's not such a big audience, so we're all actually going to a reception um, afterwards in a, in a private residence, but my team will be upstairs at a table. And if you would like to join uh, there, you'd be most welcome, and we, would, we will all be there, and we would love to carry on the discussions. This, this event is really a springboard for a year of programming where we're going to look at how artists can link with the Sustainable Development Goals, how artists between New York and the Arab world as two centers of energy, cultural energy, political energy, economic energy, could create models that other people could follow. So um, I would now like to invite Robert Skinner uh, from the Partnerships Department at the UN um, to sort of wrap this up with a call to action, because this is not about just talking, this is about an opportunity for us all to act. So thank you very much. Uh, great, there are lots of lessons to be learned uh, tonight. And uh, my first lesson is never be the UN bureaucrat that follows three fascinating artists <laughs> to the stage. 
um, because it really they told the story much better than I can, um, you know, from the UN side. But it truly has been been great to be here and be part of this conversation and hear the sustainable goals translated into the language of action and activity. And you were talking about a call to action. I feel like I don't even really need to make one. I mean, the examples here, you know, it, it's from you know the the panel that you just heard from and all the work they're doing, you know, to drive what we're trying to do through the UN, through governments, through the private sector, through cultural institutions, through civil society, to do things. Um, you know, the, as, as uh, Marie Rudil indicated, you know, culture and arts are so important to the work of UNESCO. It's important to the work that all of us are doing at the United Nations. That's why I'm so pleased to be part of the conversation tonight and to be here. Um, and we know that since the goals were adopted in 2015, that we've had to push past just the governments to bring in all of these different sectors to be part of it. And that's what my office is all about, really. The UN Office for Partnerships. Um, and I always emphasize the word for when I'm talking about our office because we see our job as bringing people together and then having them go off and take actions together. The UN can be a great convener, a great body that says, that brings these different sectors together, particularly arts and cultural communities together, you know, to take action on the goals. Because, you know, arts and, and culture really transcend the language that we use at the UN. And I joke about being a UN bureaucrat. I am one. And I can say, you know, that some of the language we use is difficult. You know, even the term sustainable development goals, when we were creating these, we had big debates about it. You know, what, what do we call these? What are we going to do with these goals to be inspirational, to get people to really take action? I'm not quite sure we totally got it right. Um, but we can use arts and culture to deliver the message and drive that home because it is transcendent and because it is something that all people relate to. It crosses borders. It doesn't you know, only know one culture. We see artists and we see uh, uh, folks from the cultural world coming together to do these kinds of amazing things. And I think that's really what it's about. And my call to action would be, you know, get behind culture, get behind the arts, participate in your communities, be part of this, because the goals are not, they're called the global goals in some circles. The civil society folks that we work with often call them the global goals, and, that, and that's great, but it's really about delivering locally. Everyone can get involved. You see in the, from the smallest towns in the U.S., you know, to the Tigris River, you know, to the Bronx, um, you know, to all these art uh, installations that are going to be taking place over the next several months um, you know, through this program. Everyone can get involved. It, you know, it's not about us at the UN. It's about all the peoples of the world coming together to drive this action to make the world a better place. So I think we should give the panel one more round of applause because that was amazing. <laughs> and thanks to all the partners for bringing this together to make meaningful change. And thanks to all of you for being here and being part of this. Good night.